So anyways, um, let's get to our guests. Um, before I introduce everyone, just to give everyone a heads up on how it's going to work, um, I'll introduce all three of our guests. Um, and then I will uh, ask a couple introductory questions just to kick things off. But the goal is to hopefully have the uh, audience, all your attendees, uh, approaching 50 people on right now. Um, so just go ahead and uh, use the raise hand button um, and I'll make sure to get to you, uh, put the camera on you if you have a question to ask. Um, the raise hand button, if you don't know, you click the participants button at the bottom of your screen. And then um, when you click that, a little box comes up and you'll see the raise hand option there. Um, so uh, go ahead and do that. Even if you have a question, if you know you want to ask one, you can, it's never too early and I'll just get to you when the time is right. So um, please go for that. Um, and uh, I'll ask as many questions as I need to, but I feel like we'll have an active crowd here and uh, we'll cut it off at about 90 minutes or so um, or until the questions run out. All right, so um, we are going to get to our introductions. For me, since I see you right now, I'm going to go to you first. How you guys doing? Hey, Romy. Welcome. Um, all right, so Romy Jimenez. Romy um, lives in Fort Lauderdale now, but she grew up in Jersey, a uh, diehard Yankees fan. Um, she has pursued a career in baseball since the beginning. Uh, she studied uh, sports management at Barry University and then a law degree um, from Nova University. Um, she started out on the nonprofit side of things, uh, running her own company that put on events for baseball stars like Andres Calaraga, Dennis Martinez, guys like that. And she would do, um, you know, charity softball games, golf tournaments, dinners, baseball camps, things like that. Um, and uh, props to you on that because I know those things are not easy <laughs> to do. Um, during that time, she was also the executive director for the Gio Gonzalez Foundation. Um, the former pitcher for the Nationals, of course, and other teams. Um, and he always made a big impact in the community at all the stops of his MLB career. And uh, Romy was a big part of that. A um, uh, number of years ago, Romy made the transition to the player representation side, uh, where now she's a player, in a, a real player in the global game. Um, her stable of clients includes uh, mostly guys from Latin America, and she really excels at finding them contracts around the world, whether it be um, in the United States, you know, signing their first amateur contracts out of Latin America or veterans looking for opportunities in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Mexico, et cetera, be it in the winter leagues or full season leagues. Um, so basically she's just constantly opening doors for players to play all over the, all over the world and embodies uh, for sure how baseball is a, is a global game and uh, is really showing how uh, baseball can bring people together for the greater good, socially and professionally, you know, locally or across oceans. And so that's why I wanted to have you on today and, and welcome. Thanks for joining us, Romy. Hey, thank you. You're welcome. Good to be here. All right. I'm going to go to Jen next. And Saya, you're going to be after that. So I hope you're going to be ready. <laughs> hey, Jen. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So Jen, uh, Jennifer Wolf. Uh, she grew up in Massachusetts, proud member of Red Sox Nation at one time, <laughs> uh, where she uh, yes, also- In my past. <laughs> yeah, in the past, where she also pursued a career in baseball from the beginning. Um, I believe you even landed an internship with the Red Sox before even going off to college, which is pretty impressive. Um, she's also a proud member uh, of, or a proud alum of Georgetown, I know, um, where you studied uh, business and Spanish and uh, worked to build a career in sports. Uh, she got positions with ESPN and the Nationals while in college. And then after graduating, uh, landed a coveted baseball operations internship with the New York Mets, um, and then parlayed that into a job at MLB's Office of the Commissioner, working uh, in Latin American operations um, in New York, and also in the DR, where we overlapped for about a year or so. And, uh, Jen and I sat next to each other in, in, uh, in the bullpen, as we called it, and um, had a good time down there. So, um, but after that, she, she left DR to join the Mets again, 
did minor league ops for the Mets, played a big role in their whole player development system. Um, now she is with the Cleveland Indians, as you can see by the C on her chest. Um, basically, like at the Indians, she's the life skills coordinator, and she puts all of her past experience together to help players, coaches, and staff um, achieve and exceed their personal and professional goals. Um, I would say, as you all can tell, she's already had more experience than many of us will have in their whole career and still got a lot ahead of her. So, um, Jen, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for that introduction. That was You're awesome. welcome. Yeah. <laughs> got to make sure people know. <laughs> um, so for those of you who are not so familiar with Japanese baseball, um, few last names in the game can compare with Nomura. Um, it's similar to maybe uh, baseball names like Boone or Griffey or maybe Vivesi. Um, her dad, Kenny, played in the minor leagues in Japan. Um, her uncle, Don, also played professional baseball, is much more well known for being uh, the agent for Hideo Nomo that brought him from Japan to the US. A uh, quick plug on that. We interviewed him on Chatter Up. You can see that on YouTube. Um, Saya's grandfather, the late uh, Katsuya Nomura, is one of the all time Japanese baseball legends and is in the pantheon of greatest baseball figures for his play on the field and as a, as a manager. Um, so I grew up in the LA area. Um, she's always spent a lot of time in Japan too. Uh, she attended Grand Canyon University where she majored in sports psychology. Um, her first job was in Japan working in athlete management, uh, first with an agency and then as a freelancer. Um, she parlayed that into an opportunity with the LA Angels where she currently still employed uh, working in guest relations. Uh, she made a big impact right away with the Angels. Um, she was the organizational employee of the year in 2018. Um, I know that Saya can also appreciate the global aspect of baseball with her strong uh, global connections. And as proof of that, she even uh, hosts a weekly Twitter event that, focus, that focuses on the international aspect of the game um, along with Jose Moda of the famous Dominican baseball family. Uh, he broadcasts the Angels games in English and Spanish. Um, so in a short time, Saya has made a big impact in the baseball world. And I imagine with her credentials, she'll continue to make an even greater impact in the years to come. So Saya, welcome. And um, if you're able to hear me, just go ahead and speak up and interrupt me. But otherwise, we're just going to continue on. So. All right, I have a couple questions. Um, just to kick things off and start in the beginning. Um, I'm curious uh, for all three of you, um, basically that your story of getting your foot in the door. They say working in baseball, uh, the hardest thing is getting your foot in the door. So uh, we'll start with you, Jen. Um, can you explain a little bit about how you were able to do that and what your story is in the beginning? Sure. So um, I kind of like Shane noted, I started before I was even in college. Um, and in high school, I worked at a like local bagel shop on the weekends. And um, Lou Gorman, who used to be the GM of the Red Sox, among other things, um, he came in all the time. And one day I finally got up the courage and just said, hey, Mr. Gorman, you know, my name is Jen. I'm graduating high school soon and I'm really interested in working in baseball. And he gave me um, his business card and he wrote a name and phone number on the back and he said, call this woman um, and see if, you know, if she has any internships available. Um, so on the one hand, my story is, is kind of like, I, I, I went and I interviewed and I got the internship. My only qualifications were working at a bagel shop. So I still, you know, I still <laughs> pinch myself sometimes, um, but it, it kind of always like makes me think uh, something my parents always say, which is that you make your own luck. And so, you know, there is something about being in the right place at the right time, but you also have to kind of seize that opportunity um, when it comes. And um, once I did that internship with Boston, which was right after, it was in uh, the summer of 05. So right after they had won the World Series for the first time in, in 86 years, like I was sold and never wanted to do anything else ever again, but work at a baseball field. So. <laughs> Um, very fortunate that I haven't had to really work at anything else since then. 
Nice. Well, did, and how did you know about Lou Gorman or who he was or you know, that's being a high schooler? <laughs> how did you know? So it's hard to grow up in Boston and not be a baseball fan, um, especially in that time frame. Um, and I can't re- like remember exactly how I knew who he was, but he always came in in a Red Sox jacket. And I think it was actually my dad who had mentioned to me like, hey, you, you should probably talk to him. Like, this is something you want to do. You should make sure you say something to him. Nice. Well, good for you. That's that's a bold move, and it worked out. <laughs> for yeah. sure. Yeah. All right. Romy, we're going to go to you next. Wow. I've worn many hats. I know that for a fact. <laughs> I began in the baseball, well, aside from being a sports fan and a baseball fan all my life growing up, I went to college uh, for photography and my love of sports led me into wanting to focus on shooting baseball photography. And at the time, the Florida Marlins had begun their spring training. So I mean, I'm not, I'm old, but not that old. (laughs) So, you know, I went in to start doing some uh, photography for a publication called Baseball Weekly and I got my credentials. And I just started doing photography and photography and in, in baseball, from my experiences, it's, it's yeah, obviously who you know, but when you start building a rapport with the players, you know, the only female being on the field, taking uh, pictures and, you know, wanting to build that rapport and that respect in, you know, in the baseball world, you know, one, they would see me constantly and it was being uh, Hispanic, you know, a lot of players, you know, were drawn to me as far as, um, my work as a photographer, but also, you know, talking about heritages and, and so forth. So I did that for a couple of years. And once that evolved, I had um, a friend of mine that was doing like collectible shows and things like that. And he knew, I knew of some players that wanted to, you know, do signings and things as Marlin players, as the Marlins began here in South Florida back in 93, 94. So Moving forward, I had never honestly considered being getting involved in player representation until further down the road. So I was doing a lot of PR and marketing for a few clients, uh, Kilvio Vera's, Edgar Renteria here in South Florida. I'd always had my own company, my own business. I've never worked like for an agency or any type of organization, but I was able to do connect with the right people and build that rapport and respect that, you know, the work that I do uh, for at the time, uh, marketing, NPR, you know, it was it was um, obviously feasible for my client. And also I build a rapport of working hard. So as time went by, I would start, I met a player who was playing a co-ed uh, softball team that Jose Canseco had here in South Florida. And I wanted, at that point, I was, I, I wanted to get more involved into the nonprofit side, special events and coordinating. So one thing led to another. I started getting this player involved in different charities in South Florida. Then the Marlins won the World Series. And, you know, it, it's just been a domino effect out over the course of the years. And as we will all know, the baseball world is very small. So as I continued to do all my charity work, you know, I was recommended through this player that, you know, yeah, Romy does events, X, Y, Z. And that's how I ended up with Wilson Alvarez Foundation, um, did special events in Venezuela. He played with the Tampa Rays for a couple of years. And then Dennis Martinez came to the event and wanted to know who did, you know, who organized this and one thing led to another. So it was my career going, getting into the process of baseball was based off of recommendations from the work that I actually, you know, was able to successfully um, coordinate for these players and their uh, personal foundations and, you know, different causes. So as the time went moving forward, I began to meet a lot of people locally in South Florida, just because I love baseball and, and always loved, enjoyed it at all levels from T-ball, you know, all the way up to, you know, college and minor leagues and so forth. So one thing led to another and during the network, but I wasn't, I honestly can say that I was not purposely networking to grow or to make myself known or 
you know, being the limelight that I'm, I'm very, I like to work behind the scenes. That's, that's my forte. So uh, once things went moving forward, I had met Gio Gonzalez and his family, you know, through other mutual friends and the friendship started. Gio's like my son. So he's, you know, very special to me and my family. And as his mom had wanted to set up a nonprofit. So she was like, you know, Romeo, I want to wait for Gio. Hopefully it gets drafted. And as time progresses, you know, I want you to be the executive director. So I was all antsy and excited. I was like, oh, cool, this is my perfect, you know, opportunity to be an executive director, X, Y, Z. Well, he finally got his shot with the Nats and I worked there for three years with him. But throughout this whole course of my baseball career, I had always had been pulled to the point where I wanted to represent players, but I was not at a point where I was not so much sure of myself, but I'm a true believer that timing is everything and of the essence and your level of maturity, obviously, as you progress in your baseball career, you know, it has to be, it has to be the right, you have to be, you know, feel that confidence and secure enough for yourself to be able to, you know, present yourself as a, as an agent or, you know, some type of representative. So, you know, I had been in, I got involved with uh, J2 signings, July 2 free agent amateur signings out of Venezuela uh, with a business partner of mine who just so happens that I got him a job when he was 16 years ago. And we had kept the, the relationship, family, and he called me up one day and said, Romy, look, I'm looking for an investor to open up shop in Venezuela and, you know, let's, let's give it a shot. And I was like, Hey, I'm ready. At that point I was ready. I was like, you know what, let's just go forward. And one thing led to another. And I was super excited because it's a huge investment as you know, people know that that are in the, in that type of uh, part of the game. And finally, I had one of my guys sign with the Texas Rangers. And that was like, that was like the big hurrah. So as we move forward, I also had my close ties are with Venezuela. Um, you could say maybe it's because of Wilson Alvarez Foundation, but it's, that's just the way things have worked out. And that, that, uh, that summer that I signed the player, I was getting, I got a call from another friend, longtime associate, uh, that I met here in Miami years ago. And he kept asking me, he's like, listen, I've got guys that are sitting here in Venezuela looking for jobs, even if it's in the independent league. So I was like, well, let's give it a shot. So I just started cold calling, sending emails. You know, I, I felt, I feel at the time, I felt at the time and continue that, you know, it has to be a level of confidence because you're, you're, you're battling and you're dealing with a lot of, uh, a lot of organizations and scouts and even family members that they, they want results, you know, they want the contract and, you know, they just want to get back either into the game or continue their career. Yeah. So as you know, I, I could sit here and talk all day. I don't want to hold everybody up, but. All right. Well, that's a good segue because um, Saya is with us now. So I'm going to. Well, I can continue if you'd like. So I can, you know, <laughs> there's, <talk> to you. <laughs> there's plenty, there's plenty to follow up on there and plenty to discuss, but um, yeah, we're going to, we're going to move on, but that was, thank you for, that's good. I'm, we got your story now. So now we all have the foundation and hope all of you have, are going to use the raise hand feature there and, and follow up on some of that stuff with Romy. But thanks, Romy. Oh, and Jen, can I add something? Jen, I, re yeah. I recall when you were with the Mets and I specifically sent you without knowing you some information about a Cuban national workout I was having. This was when you were the Mets, but I'm glad I've got a chance to meet with you now. <laughs> oh, for sure. Likewise. Likewise. I remember that. <laughs> I also just uh, signed a, a current minor leaguer with the Indians uh, to the agency. So I'm sure I'll be running into you. Oh, there you go. Awesome. <laughs> Your guy will be very well taken care of. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Saya, I'm going to you. Can yeah. you hear me now? Yeah, we're good. Oh, All my right. gosh. Okay. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. It's all good. So I was just, um, I introduced you already, so we're all set there. But uh, I, we just asked our first question, which basically I was curious. Um, Jen and Romy told us how they got their foot in the door with their first job working in baseball. And uh, how did that work out for you? 
Uh, well, I grew up in the industry um, ever yeah. since I was very young, uh, surrounded by players, coaches, uh, managers. I just grew up on the field and um, I didn't learn to appreciate the game until I moved to Japan, which was in 2013. And that's when I started to pursue a career in baseball or in sports. And I interned for a sports management company in Japan. And it was very challenging because I am Japanese, but I was born and raised in the States. So to adjust the cult, adjust to the Japanese uh, culture or the learn the business etiquette um, was very challenging for me, but it really uh, helped me with my work ethics when I came back to the States. Um, I worked for, uh, I helped with my college baseball team. I assisted, assisted players, uh, former players. And in 2017 is when I started working with the Los Angeles Angels. And actually Marty Keener was the one that encouraged me to write a letter to Tim Mead, who was at the time the vice president um, of the media department. And he uh, called me back and we had a nice chat. And um, I just, I applied actually online <laughs> and I went in for, in for an interview and um, everything just kind of fell into place after that. Cool, cool. I'm glad that you said um, how you didn't appreciate baseball right away because I wasn't sure if that was fair game. You had mentioned that, but so what was it you grew up around the game. What was it that really made you appreciate it uh, kind of later in your life and, and then want you to work in, in the game? I read a book called Mental Game of Baseball. Mm. Um, and I, if you love baseball or sports, I really encourage everyone or just anyone to read it. Um, it's a very fascinating book and it's not something that you can just apply to baseball, but just to your everyday life or to business. And I think that's when I actually started respecting the game more and um, understanding more that it's more than just a sport. Yeah, cool. All right. Yeah, I've heard of that book. But I've never read it. It's um, a great book. Yeah, I'm sure some people here have read it. If you have, let us know in the chat if you've read, if you've read the book. Um, all right. Well, thanks, Saya, and, and all good. We're, think, we're good now. Um, all right. So uh, I have, I'll give you one more question for all three of you. Um, but in the meantime, uh, now that everyone has been introduced, um, if you could, I'm going to mute everyone again, by the way, just because there's some noise. Um, if you have any questions, like I said, use the raise hand feature now that you have an intro for everyone. Um, but be, while uh, people gather up the courage for that. Um, another question that just, just to kind of continue with more kind of the beginning, I guess it could be a current part of your career too. Um, baseball is a sport that lends itself to mentorship. Um, and I'll let any of the three of you speak up if, if you have a strong mentor, but I'm curious if either, if any of you had mentors in the beginning or, or currently that have helped you and who they are and in what way they've they've had an influence in you? I'll go first, <laughs> I guess. All right. I would definitely say it mentor as far as age, player representation would be um, uh, Scott Shapiro with Magnus Sports. You know, I met, I met him years ago when he got, he had his first client. But at the time I wasn't really focused on that. But it, I always had that in the back of my mind. And it's just, I saw him, he was very personable and open communication. He, he, tr he treated and still treats, obviously, his players as family. So I found that, you know, very important as far as, you know, putting that on my, on my top priority list when, you know, I was at the time when I decided to, you know, pursue this part of uh, the industry. So yeah. he's definitely... Uh, He's definitely a good guy, though. Yeah, he's well respected in in the agent game. I know. Yeah, he's um, a character, but he's a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> how about how about you, Jen? So 
Um, I've had a few people, I think, that have kind of helped guide me along the way. Um, one of them's actually on this call, Tyrone Brooks um, <laughs> at MLB. So that was a nice coincidence. Um, Ty, we didn't plan this. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, trying to get in the game, um, he was one of the first people that accepted my cold call or I guess cold email. Um, and we met for coffee out in San Francisco. He was with the Cleveland Indians at the time, actually, um, and was just very helpful in, in helping to let me know what opportunities were available and what kinds of things I should be doing to pursue different opportunities. Um, also have had some really good mentors, um, such as Omar Manaya, um, who uh, I was with at the Mets when I was an intern and then he left and I left, but he was able to kind of always help me um, with different opportunities throughout my time in baseball up until now. Um, but I think what what has kind of been really, um, really cool for me, I haven't had a ton of female mentors or really any female mentors within the game, um, but um, I've started to kind of form my, my own like little group of women in the game that, that are more like peers than mentors, but I think Sometimes you need that as well. Um, so obviously it's always important to have, have um, a sponsor is another kind of way to say mentor, but you know, people that are willing to guide you. Um, but as a woman, they're, they're few and far between. Um, and so I, oh, I see the question in the chat. Yes, um, I am helping to mentor other females as well. So that's kind of, um, you know, I think because it, my network is mostly my peers. Um, it's been nice to have people that are going through exactly what you're going through and to bounce ideas off of and stuff. And then, um, um, because it, while most of my mentors have been male and have been awesome, um, sometimes they don't understand some of the differences of being a female in the game as well. Yeah, cool. I just put it um, in the uh, chat. Jen is a star now. She's a, she had an article in the New York Times about her a couple of weeks ago. So I put that in the chat for everyone to take a look at. Uh, but that's on that topic. And um, yeah, thanks for that. That's a good answer. And I definitely have some follow ups on that. But uh, Saya, do you have any mentors that you want to acknowledge? Uh, well, like Jen, Jennifer, um, I really haven't had any uh, female mentors, um, or you don't really come across females in the industry. Um, but I always go to Don Nomura, who's my uncle. And those of you who don't know, who doesn't know, he's, uh, he's an agent. He represented Nomo and, um, uh, he's brought over, uh, numbers of Japanese players over to the States. And, uh, he's someone that I respect very much and I always go to him for advice um, and also Jose Moda he's our broadcaster with the Angels and um, I always call him up whenever whenever I need advice. Those are two great people to have access to for sure. Yes. Um, uh, oh Nicole oh never mind yeah mental book of baseball Jenny was asking what the title what the, of the book is and Nicole answered that for you. Um, you know, since since all of you touched on it here, I'm going to go ahead and, and ask my question about um, kind of what you're mentioning about being a woman working in baseball. Um, so, you know, of course, you know, it's always been known as a man's game and all that stuff. But, you know, for me, for me, it's been like, you know, I worked, my boss is a woman, Kim Ang at MLB, and I've worked with plenty of, of badass women, Jen included. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, of course, you're a minority and working in baseball, um, and there's certain challenges I know that go along with that. But um, have, if, are any of you willing to share any of the particular difficulties you've had being a woman in baseball, or at least just give advice? I know there's a couple on this call who'd be interested in getting advice as a female or any aspiring baseball professional regard, regardless of gender. Jen, we're going to start with you because you have the I, Times article. I figured. Um, so I think I, I was very fortunate that um, that I was given a chance early on. And I think that, sorry, this is Nala, my cat. She says hi. <laughs> um, 
you know, that I was given opportunities. Um, and I, I come from a family where, um, my dad like worked out of the house and my mom was the one that commuted and worked into, in the office. So I always like wanted to work and always like wanted a career. Um, and so when I approached, I approached baseball with that same kind of attitude. Like I just knew I was going to be able to find a job and I guess was kind of naive about being a woman trying to do it. Um, but I, I think on the one hand, it's, it's been nice that baseball has started or not started, but baseball is focusing on a lot of like analytics and you don't necessarily have had to play in the game in order to um, have a role. And I think that's especially helped in coaching now that you're seeing a lot more women in coaching. Um, but one of the downsides is that analytics is a big part of that. And there's not a lot of women in analytics either. So it's like, on the one hand, it helps just in general bring people in the game who haven't necessarily um, played at a professional level. Um, but, but, you know, there's still some barriers for women to get in the game. Um, but I think, you know, I've, I've had great people look out for me, um, worked with people like Shane, who, who um, you really need allies and sponsors. And I think, you know, those are good people to have around you. Um, working for Kim was a dream come true. I remember like reading the press release when they announced that she was, I was already at MLB and she like came on to be my boss and just, like was floored, couldn't believe it. It was like, am I dreaming? <laughs> um, but I, I think like the biggest thing is, is you know that you're coming into a, a situation where you're the minority. Um, so you need to have some level of, of confidence and comfort. Um, but also you shouldn't be afraid to speak up. I think a lot of, um, a lot of the stuff that I have faced as far as like not feeling included and things like that was more just like, there's some structural things, I guess is kind of what I'm saying. So, you know, you go to a facility and like, there's no women's bathroom in the clubhouse, obviously, or um, no place for you to shower or change where all your male coworkers have that. Um, and so it's kind of one of those like, things that if, if you're not a woman, you're not thinking about it. Cause you're like, I have my locker room. I have my, you know, I can use the bathroom. I can shower in the clubhouse. And um, so sometimes you just kind of need to speak up and, and make people aware like, Hey, um, what am I going to do? And I, cause I don't think it's necessarily malicious. I think just, it's something that people don't even think about. And a lot of these facilities were built years and years ago before you even thought that women would be around per se. Um, so I think that's kind of like, just, just know it, it'll be, I don't want to call it a struggle, but know that, that it's going to be a little different and be ready for that. Um, but also, you know, if you see something and you're like, Hey, this is an easy fix. Like, can we order some women's smalls or can we order, you know, some not men's clothes? <laughs> I see Romy laughing. That's like a very common <laughs> complaint. The clothes are comfortable. <laughs> Well, and like, we don't want to wear the boxy men's clothes. <laughs> um, just little things like that is, is huge. Um, and sometimes you just got to be like, Hey, like, I don't want to wear that same thing or, Hey, like, can we figure out where I can use the bathroom, please? You mean the, the pink hat is not sufficient for you? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> That's um, a whole other topic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Romy, how about you? Um, anything on that topic to add well i've i've had a lot of i would say interesting experiences similar to jen's but mine has been individually with other agents and the latin american environment of of professional uh, uh baseball in latin america and yeah. I want to just give you a brief just scenarios that I've encountered. It's not that they they've been receptive. I say hello to everyone. I pretty much, you know, have a pretty cool personality. Some people think I don't, but it's all within, you know, grasp. It's just that they see me and they're like, "Oh, here comes Romy." And personally, I could give a darn how they perceive me because my job is to do the best job I can and to be and and make sure I know how to communicate with GMs 
and uh, assistant GMs, pro scouting, internationally scouting directors, and that whole on, on those departments. You know, I, I've I've been at a few meetings where, you know, they there's people they know who I am, but they don't. But then they'll look at me like, oh, there's that girl again. Oh, what she do? What is she doing here? And I can see it on their faces, but you know, I'm sure of myself and confident enough where I, you know, I keep to myself, and it's just about representing my guys and making sure that my agency is respected and you know we have a family environment. And I, right now, it's funny because I have a guy who I met on a flight to the winter meeting. He does a lot of July 2 signings out of the Dominican Republic and another gentleman. And they're just so intrigued to know, you know, who are you guys and video. And I'm, you know, I'm not here to share. I mean, I'm in comp there. They're my competition. You understand what I'm saying? And I just, I just take it with a grain of salt. You know, I don't take any uh, personal. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. The uh, yeah, the added layer of opposition when you're in Latin America. Yeah, that's. Oh yes, and being a female <laughs> Latina, yeah. so it's yeah. it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, right, that, think... me, that just reminded me of a quick anecdote back from my days working with Shane. So um, I helped out a lot a lot of events and you know like showcases and stuff for the amateur cool. players, and a friend of mine came down to visit for like a week, and. Um, I put him to work and I was like, you're going to be my intern for the week and you're going to help us out at the event. And so I think we threw like an MLB hat on him or something. And yeah. all of a sudden, all the agents went up to talk to him. And I'm like, I've been here for nine months. You guys have yeah. seen my face exactly. everywhere. Yeah. I, it's fine with me. We're good. Yeah. This guy has one day on the job. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's, it's trying times, but you know, yeah. it's, it's something you have to keep steadfast and when somebody says no you just got to keep going and pushing and pushing until you know you're able to get your foot in the door and you know especially with asia and mexico you know there it, it's it takes a while to build that rapport and you know the culture it's it, they're not used to having females it's either marketing or xyz i'm not knocking anybody's job but it's just facts. It's just, you know, what it is as far as female being perceived in the aging representation field. So it's, it's got to be self-assured and make sure you're, you know, they respect, you know, but yeah. you know, it's a men's environment. I expect, you know, the eyes and the looking, but it's, it's got to keep moving forward. That's, that's just the bottom line. That's how I, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, we have a lot of questions, but Sai, I want to give you a chance to speak to that too before we go to our guest questions. It's definitely about. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we got you. We got you. Uh, it's definitely it's all about confidence, uh, with, regardless if you're male or female. Um, but you do get treated differently if you're a female, and I've witnessed it numerous times. Um, you have to respect yourself, and you have to value yourself. Um, you have to be vocal if you don't feel comfortable with something you have to say you have to speak up and you have to surround yourself with good people in the industry and have a good mentor as well yeah yeah i like that all right cool um bob you've had your hand up for a while so i'm going to you hey bob okay yeah i was just gonna ask a couple questions one of them uh, i saw in the chat from gh so i'll i'll ask that question <laughs> okay uh one, uh, I've, I've been retired for 10 years, don't have any interest in working, but because uh, I don't need to work anymore. But the one question a lot of people would want to ask is internships, because I've, I've been involved in internships and work. And uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages, let's, let's say in Major League Baseball, about internships? And that may be something that Jennifer can answer. And then the uh, second question is uh, that was brought up by GH is uh, uh, where where it was an asset or you felt you brought something beneficial to the table that maybe had been overlooked by being a female. So uh, any of the three, you could probably answer that. So, okay. Got it. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> okay. Well, since you directed the internship question at me, um, you know, I think one of the, I'm going to toot Tyrone's horn again, but uh, one of the great things that he's done as part of the, diversity and inclusion initiative is to publicize a lot of the internships that normally weren't um, 
weren't out in the open. They were kind of like, if you knew somebody or if you, um, if you knew to reach out to teams, basically, like you could, you could get an internship. And a lot of those are now listed online, um, which is huge. And I think that can help bring a lot of people in the game. Um, the, there are opportunities, like the, the internships and the opportunities I've seen now are so different than the stuff I was looking at 15 years ago when I first got in the game. Um, and so I think that that's a great way to get started. And it, it's a great way to really learn the ins and outs of everything. Like my internships were always more comprehensive um, than, you know, my full-time roles because you you get a taste of, of everything. So in my baseball ops internship, I got to experience amateur scouting and the draft, international baseball ops, major league ops, player development. Um, and so it kind of gave me like a taste of, of what each field was and allowed me to focus on kind of where um, I wanted to be. And then as to your second question, I think, um, I think anytime you bring diverse people together, it's beneficial. So anytime you bring people with different backgrounds, experiences, cultures, ages, ethnicities, like you're just making, um, you're bringing in different perspectives, bringing in different ideas. And I think like adding in women as part of that. Um, I think that, um, you know, you can talk about like empathy and, and things. And I don't wanna say that that's like specifically female, um, but I think um, some of the stuff that's helped me particularly is empathy and communication skills which are kind of more of the soft skills. Um, but I, I wouldn't be in the position that I am right now without those. Uh, but being bilingual, being able to communicate in two different languages, being able to connect with 16 year old players that we've just signed and 85 year old coaches and um, which we have multiple at Cleveland. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, I don't wanna say that's unique to being a female um, but I think it's sometimes something that's overlooked um, by, by different teams or, you know, at different points in my career. And I think that's something that, that has really been able to help and really gotten me where I am today. Yeah, good. I, I agree with that. More voices in the room, more diverse voices are better. Uh, Romy and, and Saya, no, you don't have to add anything if you don't want, but please speak up if you have anything on, on that. That's an interesting question. Gio Hernandez, good question. He's the one that, uh, GH in there. All right, all good if you don't want to add anything. Also shout out to Melissa Rodriguez, another woman working in baseball. She works for the Dodgers. She's on the call with us, hey, Melissa. Um, all right, Eric Peterson, going to you next. Eric. Hey. Hey, Jen, how are you? Hi, um, <laughs> question for, for everybody. So, uh, and Jen touched on it in one of Francis before um, about uh, allyship and being an ally. I guess within the industry and, and just kind of business in general, how, how can men be better allies? Well, in my experiences, you know, I'm a people person, so I I have to get a feel for the person's personality, regardless whether it's male, female, and just make sure you're you're a good listener to what they have to say, and you know, make sure that you know you understand each other and be and are able to build a, an alliance based off of respect on your knowledge of the game. Because for instance, when I'm speaking to, uh, for example, Giovanni, he's a great guy. And you know, you have to, I've been able to build a rapport with him. So you have to definitely be open to any, to suggestions, whether you, don't, whether you like them or not. So the, the interaction and the bond with men and women in the baseball environment it can only be a plus, but I'd be the first one to tell you that I've a lot of people in, whether it's MLB or just international, are intimidated at times when they hear a female speaking the same terminology and baseball lingo that they do in their jobs day to day. I mean, that, that's, that's something that, you know, that barrier has to be broken 
but once again, you got to get a feel for the person or the type of uh, man you're speaking to directly. Coming from a, a women's perspective. Yeah, yeah, good point. I, and I've, I've seen that before. Like, oh, you're talking baseball with a woman and she'll yeah. say, she'll, she'll use baseball lingo and some guy will like, you know, comment like, oh, that's cool that you, you know, like, <laughs> like give her props for it or something like that. It's like, oh, Especially when you're cool. speaking to, you know, an organ, uh, an executive that, you know, you're trying to get a contact a contract for, or you're wanting them to send like an international, you know, cross checker to see your guy for July 2 signing. You got to know how to, how to speak that, that terminology and that lingo. Yeah, yeah. You want to be taken seriously. Um, yeah, totally. Thanks for that. Sire, Jen, do you have anything about to, to add as far as like how uh, men that you work with could be better allies in, in the workplace? Yeah, I'm laughing because I see Gabe's comment about like, oh, you're a baseball fan? Name every Cy Young winner. So like rule number one, do not test women on their knowledge of sports. <laughs> Like, it is yeah. not we do not need like to be quizzed every time you find out we work in sports it is not fun. <laughs> um no but I, I for me personally and I don't know if if Romy and Saya have had similar experiences um I I have found that it, I actually have well a men that have daughters or men that um are really close to their sisters they they tend to understand and I don't you know obviously every single man knows a woman in their life. Um, but, but especially like a lot of older coaches that have daughters, I felt like they could kind of see some of their daughter in me and, and that really helped. Um, and they were able to become better allies. Um, but I think too, like kind of what Romy said, once you prove that you can do whatever it is your task is, you'll be taken seriously. Um, and I, I think, uh, not that like you need to prove yourself, but I think that's true in any job. You need to prove that you're capable of it. And maybe it takes a few extra steps for, for women. But um, I, I think that what has been really inspiring for me and really kind of heartwarming is that, that players and coaches um, seem to do that really quickly. As soon as you, you show you can do your job, um, they've been very supportive. Um, and I just had to experience that when I went from one team to another and I'm in a whole new environment where I know, you know, no, none of the players knew me ahead of time. They may have known some players that I had worked with before, but I was new to them. And, and, you know, you have to earn their trust just like in any, when you join any new team or job or, or anything like that. Um, but once you do that, once you show them the value you can provide, um, they're, they're great. And, um, and I think sometimes where it's a little harder and where having allies is more important is in that office, um, environment, um, where sometimes, you know, it's, it is about what you can do, but there's other dynamics at play. Um, but I think just, you know, taking an extra second when you're making decisions, you know, am I, am I making this decision because she's a woman? Do I think this because she's a woman? And sometimes you're like, you know, I don't always want to play the female card. Um, but if you don't take that extra step and think about it, then you might actually be doing something um, because someone's a woman. And I think back at, you know, the book Lean In, which was kind of, you know, very, um, it's kind of almost like the Bible on women in, in the job world. But they talk about different stereotypes that people have about women and women have them about other women too. That, you know, if you're aggressive for a male, that's, that's a good thing. And if you're a female, it's a bad thing. Or if you're outspoken for a male, it's a good thing. And if you're female, it's a bad thing. And so just kind of remembering some of those stereotypes and some of those biases that, that you have, I think that's important to being a good ally too. Um, just, you know, taking a step back, if, if she was a man, would I think the same thing about what she said or did? Um, I think sometimes that's a really good way to check yourself. Yeah, good call, good call. Sai, I see you nodding along. Do you want to add anything? No pressure. <laughs> we covered a lot there. I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> okay, all right. So we have more questions. Gabe, I'm going to you. Thanks for that, Jen and Romy. And Eric, thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I know we were talking earlier about opportunities for, for women in baseball and how there's new ground being broken, such as with Alyssa 
knack and becoming the first female on field coach in MLB this season. I'm curious what you think the next barrier to be broken by women in baseball will be. Will it be someone moving into the front office? Will it be someone taking on a managerial position or maybe someone becoming a more prominent broadcaster and lead play by play announcer? I would, I would say definitely GM that one. It's like, right. It's like half a yard from the goal. That's, that's, I, it's going to happen <laughs> hopefully sooner than later, but there's so many women that are just, even in the scouting departments, their, their, their capabilities are amazing because they study the game in detail, you know, the knowledge, the curiosity. I think that's what, what drives us to, you know, um, succeed in, in the environment of, you know, the baseball environment. And as, as far as for myself, I don't know about Jen, but I don't know Jen that long, but you have to have, you have to be a competitor and you want to be able, you, you want to be like, Hey, you know, I got that one over on him, you know, but it's, it's not personal. It's just that it's, it's self-satisfying that, you know, you're doing the job at the same level that uh, men are, but it's, it's more challenging and gratifying for us individually as women that we get the job done correctly for what, you know, specifics that we've been hired to do. Yeah. I think I, I agree with that. I think GM, I mean, just because it's the closest right now. Um, but uh, that being said, I think that, like, I mean, just we mentioned Kim Ang earlier. If Kim was a man, she would be a general manager already. I mean, she's assistant GM of the Yankees has throughout their glory years and has all the credentials and has, and has as many interviews as anyone could have for that position. And I just can't explain any other way other than the fact that she's a woman, which is unfortunate. But that being said, she has had many interviews and Jean Afterman with the Yankees also is very well respected. And there's tons of other women in baseball operations working their way up front offices. May, Romy, maybe you'll be the first woman to negotiate a hundred million dollar contract for one of your clients. That that's the mission <laughs> and the goal. We're yeah. we'll it up. as of right now. We're there's a couple secrets around there coming soon. There you go. All right. And everybody, you'll hear about it. All Not right. Here. Cool. So. <laughs> Thanks for that question, Gabe. Uh, Toshiki, I'm going to you. Hey, Toshiki. Hey, Shane. Uh, thank you for having me. And hi, everybody. Um, uh, my question is, uh, you guys already talked about uh, perspectives from female side, uh, but uh, I would love to know what it's like to be a minority in baseball. And also my other question is, uh, I'm a college student, I'm a senior at the University of Maryland, and uh, if you could offer me some kind of advice for me to, you know, be, make it to the baseball industry someday, that would be amazing. Thanks so much. Jen? Um, so, ooh, that's the, my first advice would be to start looking for, for internships and opportunities. And so Teamworks Online is a great resource. That's where a lot of them are posted. Um, also love that you went to school at, at you're at Maryland. I went to school in the DMV also. So, right. <laughs> and I know Ty, Tyrone on this call is a big Maryland guy, so he'll be happy for that. Um, but Teamworks Online is a great resource. Um, but don't be afraid to be a little creative with the internships and the experiences that you have. I think you'd be surprised about how um, you can you can make any kind of experience what you want it to be, any kind of internship, and you can um, always pick up skills that can be translated into whatever future job that you want. So an example would be um, right out of college, I inter interned with the Washington Nationals, and I really wanted a baseball ops internship and didn't get it. And I was in the marketing department and I was doing a lot of like writing for the nationals magazine and things like that. And I was able to like through writing show my knowledge of baseball ops. Um, so similar to how, you know, writers from fan graphs and baseball prospectus and stuff get plucked for front offices. Like I kind of tried to do the same thing. Um, and so I think, you know, whatever opportunity and experience you get, um, even if it's not your first choice, it's a foot in the door. It'll get you FaceTime with the right people. Um, and you can use that experience. Um, and then as far as kind of being a minority, I, you know, 
it's interesting because I work mostly with our minor league players and half our minor league population is Latin American. So I would say over half our players are, are minorities. Um, and so on the one hand, it's, uh, everyone's experience is different and the experience of a, a Latin American player is going to be different than my experience. And, and honestly, my experience as a white woman is going to be different than Saya's experience as a Japanese woman. Like it's, you know, it, the women's experience is also very different depending on, on different groups. Um, but I think, I think as the game grows and more people, like there's more diversity around you, I think that, um, that, that it becomes easier and easier. But as I said before, you have to also advocate for yourself. And I do a lot of advocating for, for our minor league players, especially the Latin players. Um, but I also need to make sure that I'm advocating for myself. And if I see something that's like, hey, you know, well, what are the women gonna do? Like that somebody says it as like, hey, like, um, I don't know, something that kind of came to mind is there was one day that I was locked out of the building because um, our main gate was closed and the men all enter through their clubhouse, but the women's locker room doesn't have a outside door. So it was like, do I sit here and wait until like somebody shows up to unlock the main gate or do I just go through the men's locker room? And it's not something anyone had ever thought of before. And so sometimes you just need to be like, hey guys, we need another solution to this. Like, can I have a key? Um, and, and it's not, it, it, like I said before, it's never anything malicious, but you just need to know when to speak up and, and how to do it in a way also that's like productive. That's not like, oh my God, guys, like what the F I couldn't get into the building. You know, that's more just like, Hey, if this happens again, what should we do? This is my suggestion kind of thing. I'd like to add to that. If uh, Toshiki, Yes. Being, uh, speaking of minority, obviously I'm a dark complexion, female and Latina. So for me, as far as my personality, they're all pluses, hmm. but it's perceived that they're minuses. So in order to help you, you know, deal with, with those um, challenges, what's helped me a lot is I research and I research and I'm I read search all day long just to know, you know, the new trends and, you know, you know, what, what new talents out there, what countries are possibly, you know, looking into uh, broadening their, their baseball uh, involvement internationally. And the, the more knowledge you have, the, you know, the more you'll feel comfortable um, being able to, to, you know, portray who you are and, you know, um, be, let me see how I put this. Um, knowledge is power, obviously, but the more you feel comfortable with the research you've had and have done, the better and more comfortable you'll feel speaking. And you'll, you won't even think about that you're a, a minority. It's just you as a human being. Yeah, I like that. Um, Sai, I'm gonna put you on the spot right here because you you mentioned um, how being in Japan was a little bit interesting, being um, American, and then in the United States, you know, you're doing a lot with Japanese clients. I'm sure you kind of viewed as the Japanese one. So, can you speak a little bit to your experience, like fitting in, being a minority, or just somewhat of an outsider in a professional setting? Well, starting off in Japan, it really helped me because, um, I mean, it was so challenging uh, working out here and adjusting to the culture. So when I came back to the States, I just used that um, as a strength of mine. Um, and uh, you just, you have to network as much as you can, especially right now, since you're a student. Um, a, uh, uh, try to gain as much experience as you can. So working for, um, if you want to get into baseball, reach out to your college coach, uh, write letters to organizations. Uh, you never know who's going to write back. And um, knowledge is power. So study the game, study the history of the game. And it's always good to have a skill because that's going to <clears throat> that's going to set you aside from everyone else. So if you speak Japanese as well, like that's, that's a huge plus. So try to, 
have different skills and um, you're going to stand out from, you want to stand out from others. So have a skill, study the game and network. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so sure. much. Um, yeah, I did have my internship with the Nationals over summer, but like a council because of COVID. Um, so COVID is definitely making it harder. Uh, so definitely looking to connect with you if that's okay after this. And because uh, I'm definitely looking for a job. So um, definitely mm -hmm. nice to have some kind of direction. So thanks so much. Yeah. Did it. Thanks, Toshiki and Shia. And, and Tyrone's putting in the chat here um, for anyone on the call that's interested in working in the game, join the Baseball Industry Network on LinkedIn. Um, highly recommend that. It's got tons of, um, tons of people in it and Tyrone does a really good job keeping everyone up to date on what's going on. Um, that's how I met Tyrone, was from that group and then I emailed him. So highly recommend joining that group. Yeah, totally. Um, all right, Ted, going to you. Hey, Ted. Hold on. Uh Thank you. Uh, I'm from, uh, I'm a Nats fan, by the way. My two, I have two questions. One, in your experience in baseball, what is the most rewarding part of your job or, or made you happy in your, uh, on your job? And what is the most frustrating part of the job? Good question. Sorry, how about you start? Um, being at the stadium is my favorite. Yeah. Like, even if I'm having a bad day, just being at the stadium and the atmosphere at the Angel Stadium is amazing. The fans are amazing. So being at the stadium, for sure. Um, frustrating, my frustrations. Um, I would say if things aren't communicated correctly. So communication is so important um, in any kind of field. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think anyone could relate to that. All right, Romy, how about you? I would, I, I agree as far as being around the stadium and just that's that, that gives me time to just detox, just watching BP or even going to watch my nephew play at college or even a t-ball. For me, I, I live the game and breathe the game. I don't know if it's because of my Dominican descendants, but that's that's been, baseball has been life for me. And there's one main one, considering the field I'm, I'm working in is representing, is when a GM says, okay, I'm gonna send a scout to go see your guy. For me, that's like the biggest, lotto ever because of being the female and the challenge that there is that you know because i my competition is are obviously all the already established agencies and you know top uh, rated um talent that all these you know academies already have so for me that's that's definitely like uh 200 gold and now one thing that's a pet peeve of mine um is the judging, you know, judging my capability of doing my job because I am a female, but it, it, it tends to have a thick skin about it. And, you know, it, it's always, you can always work around it. That's just, you know, you have to be that uh, uh, mindset that, you know, it's not just one organization or one player. There's thousands of people out there that you can work with, so. That's what I would definitely say. Okay. Yeah. Jen, how about you? Um, so for me, the, the best is when a player that I've worked with makes it to the majors. Um, like, it's just, I feel like a proud mama bear. Um, it's the <laughs> best feeling in the world. And um, like a great example is, is Ahmed Rosario. Shane and I knew him when he was an amateur player. Um, and so I worked with him at MLB before he signed and then basically got to see his whole career with the Mets until he made it to the majors. And like, there's just no better feeling knowing that like whatever small part I played in that um, helped. Um, and, you know, now with a new team, I feel like I have like double the players that can, can mm -hmm. make it. Cause I still have 
um, players from the Mets that are making, you know, made their debuts this year. Um, like Andres Jimenez and David Peterson, but then I get to see like a Tristan McKenzie who um, I worked with at Cleveland last year, make his debut this year. Um, and so like that to me is, is the best. Um, I think as far as a pet peeve, um, I wish that baseball as an industry was a little more progressive. Um, I mean that on many fronts, you know, I think baseball um, has been slow on social justice issues. I think baseball has been slow on diversity uh, and inclusion just overall. Um, and, and I look at like the NBA and the NFL and what they do with technology and fan engagement and things like voting and, um, you know, I wish, I think MLB is improving. Um, I just wish that we were there a little more. Um, and I, you know, I think you see it in, on all aspects. I think, you know, on the medical side, I think, uh, you know, sports in, in Europe and overseas and Australia are like way ahead of us. Um, just little things like that, that I wish, you know, sometimes I'm like, it's 2020 baseball, like, let's get <laughs> with it. Um, so yeah, that would be my, my pet peeve, but it's improving, which is good. Cool. Okay, well, thank you very much. I was a teacher and a guidance counselor in middle school, and the most rewarding after so many years when a student comes back to see you. That's the like tomorrow I'm having breakfast with a former student that I taught in 1975. Uh -huh. And that's the reward of the of the business of, of being in education. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for that question. Um, if anyone uh, has questions, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, and uh, in the meantime, I'm going to go to Giovanni Hernandez. Gio had a couple questions in the chat. Um, and Gio is the speaker, the keynote speaker at the industry meetings pretty much every year on working in baseball, or was for many years. So he knows a lot about this stuff too. But Gio, um, what, are, what questions you got? And thanks for joining us too. Uh, no worries. Um, yeah, the one question I had for you guys was, what's something about this industry that you initially thought that was disproven once you started working? Or another way of putting it, what's something that surprised you about the industry once you guys were in it? Thanks. All right. Whoever wants it, take it. I'll, I'll start. I kind of already said it, but but like how quickly players and coaches accepted me was really surprising. Um, I thought that they were going to be harder to win over. Um, and it really wasn't the case. And, and um, I, I've had experiences where, you know, it's like pulling teeth to get somebody, like one of my peers in the office to try to show me something or if I needed help with something. But, you know, I can sit with a coach and talk for hours and trade baseball stories. And, and I don't know kind of why that dynamic happens. I may have been who I was interacting with and stuff, but that to me was a really, really pleasant surprise that, you know, you think that, that it'll be more awkward, like in clubhouses or, or, you know, situations with players and stuff. And to me, that was always way easier um, than kind of working in a, in a regular office or in the front office. Saya, Romy, what, are, what was unexpected for you that you've learned since joining uh, the, the baseball industry? I would have to say the same. Um, sorry. Um, wow. Well, first and foremost, I do agree with uh, Jen. My experiences with um, the players and the coaches have always been the introduction to the environment of where whatever team I might be, you know, associated with, or even going to a ball game, or knowing of what you know my past experiences have been with you know nonprofit and doing events and things like that. And um, it, I, I researched the game a lot. So I, surprises, it, wow. I I would love to add one, but I don't recall one right now. I, I mean, as far as, once again, being a female in the business, it's, there's never a dull moment. You know, I, it's just the looks I get from certain, um, certain backgrounds and eth ethnic backgrounds of, of men that work in the industry. It's like, 
you know, it, it gets to the point where I'm, I'm very sarcastic. I don't know if it's just my personality from Jersey, but, you know, I'm respectful, but don't come and BS me. You know, it's, it's like, you know, we're, we're adults here first. It's not about a man or a woman thing. We're adults first. And, you know, you, I just, I expect to be respected. You know, it's, it's, I know the game. I, I know how to move around and, you know, how to speak. And, you know, I guess it's just part of it, you know, especially dealing with the, the Latin men in, in the industry. There's, there's always a perception of, you know, oh, what is she doing? Or, you know, what, what, you know, she's so quiet. You know, she doesn't share what she's doing or who she represents. Well, they don't, you know, it's, it's, we just keep it neutral. So that's, that's something that I found that there's, there's always this intrigue about, you know, what I'm doing or who she's with. Just, just come out and ask, you know, it's just as simple as that. It's just, I don't know if I'm not very intimidating. I'm, you know, pretty laid back, but that's, that's something I have found that's, that does, I'm hoping it changes as it, as we progress in this industry, because it's, it just sits there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, um, what were you going to say about as far as surprises or things you weren't expecting? Um, in Just a good how way, welcoming, yeah. how welcoming people are, especially uh, the Angels organization. I think it's one of the best organizations to work for. And uh, people from uh, the front office or players or ex-players, um, just so friendly and welcoming. Yeah, right on. Cool. Um, I got a, another question um, for for all of you, I guess. But um, you know, of course, at Japan Ball, we we view baseball as an international game. Um, what do uh, the three of you see as far as um, the continued globalization of the game? Um, you all work in the international version in, in your own way. Um, so, uh, Romy, why don't we start with you? Because I'm curious, because you are getting guys' contracts to play in Asia and all around the world. Um, what do you see as far as like the continued blurring of borders around the world in baseball? I think it's amazingly growing. I like how MLB International has done a, a lot of um, camps. I mean, even in the smallest countries that you've never heard of, they've been and the global, the global, the global part of, you know, countries like Portugal and all these big series organizations that want to expand baseball, India, you know, there, it's just the game's receptive, you know, people, I know a lot of people just in the U.S., I guess, find it boring, but, you know, there, there's just like this, this excitement of, just waiting for a pitch to see if somebody's going to hit a home run. A lot of people, mm -hmm. I think, internationally enjoy that because it's so popular here in the states. And when I when I see tournaments in in Korea and in, in the K in in Taiwan and Japan, especially now with the pandemic, it's awesome that everybody in the world had a chance to, you know, interact and see the level of play that's increased, you know, in those leagues. And I'm currently working with a baseball academy in Cameroon, out in Africa. And, you know, these kids have raw talent. You know, it's, I, my company does a lot of sponsorship for them, you know, to help them create more awareness about baseball in Africa. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting and it's fulfilling because you know that, you know, the game of baseball has longevity. You know, obviously, obviously it's American pastime, but it's 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 more the world global pastime, and that's that's what I I enjoy seeing that you know it progress like that in so many different parts of the world. Yeah, yeah, good answer. Um, I get, that's a good answer. So I'm gonna let you speak for the other two because Susan raised her hand. And I want to go to Susan. Hey, Susan. Hi everyone. Hi Shane. Thanks as always for putting these things together. My question is for Romy. Um, is Japan an easy sell for your clients or potential clients or is MLB the only goal, the main goal that your clients have? Wow. Japan, Asia, 
it's markets are I want to, I don't want to say difficult they're complex because they expect major league caliber players either retired or that want to continue pursuing their baseball careers into another country and into other cultures and comparing it to MLB I mean MLB right now it, it boils down to the client, the, the, the type of client you have and what need the organizations uh, need at the time. And MLB obviously is the goal, but there's so many players right now that have left MLB or they've, you know, been released um, from organizations where, you know, they want to go venture out and, you know, see what, what else is out there for them. And seeing how competitive the level uh, of play has broadened and grown so much in the KBO and Taiwan and, and Japan, you know, that's, it's challenging for me because they don't know me. You know, I have to go out there and I got to hustle it. You know, I got to sell my client. I got to pitch that they're the next best thing to slice bread, but it's, you know, it's, it's what it's, it's fulfilling for me. Cause I, I just love what I do. I mean, I am a small boutique agency, but I, I can say that I've, the people that I that do want to work with our agency, the players, you know, they're they're happy and they they know. I, I always make sure and let them know that it's it's not overnight. You know, they don't know you. Yeah, you've had a successful career in MLB or you know you've played double A ball, but it's just a different type of. They see they want they want results now. You know, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. It's not a you know let's develop the player. You know, they, they, they want to win championships because their fan, their fan base out there is incredibly huge. So do, uh, Romy, do uh, the Asian teams that you've dealt with, do they have, like when looking at Latin American players, do they view them favorably, disfavorably, or, or just the same? All they care about is their ability to produce. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Because there's a little echo. Do the Asian teams have, um, view Latin American players on the same playing field as Americans, or do they prefer them or, or maybe give them a disadvantage? Oh, no, they love Latino players. There's just a different level of, of, of hungry to play the game. And, you know, when, it's, when you say Latin America, it could be from any country, Dominican, mm -hmm. Puerto Rico, even Cuba. They love Cuban players out there. So there's, there's just a different hungry of, of playing the game, there's there's more um, they they play with more spirit. That's why yeah. I think they they like that type of caliber, um, that type of you know player from Latin America. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, we I think anyone who follows Japanese baseball notices that there's been just a continual shift of more and more Latin players filling up their import player quota, which is interesting. So makes sense that you're saying that. Um, all right, we're getting pretty close to the end here. So if anyone has a question, uh, raise your hand and, and uh, we'll get to you. Um, Sai, I'm, I'm, I have a question for you. Um, obviously, you know, Japan ball, we're bringing people to Japan and other countries to watch baseball. And you're oftentimes dealing with um, fans going the other way. Um, you, I know you deal with a lot of Japanese clients at Angel Stadium. Um, what type of groups are you seeing? Uh, is it individual um, things or is, are fans or are other groups coming? And um, I guess what is their expectation and when they're coming to see a major league baseball game and, and how do you, um, yeah, how do you help them have a good experience? Well, I, I've noticed that majority of them are from Japan. They don't speak English. So I think the fact that I'm there and I speak English, I can make the experience more comfortable for them. Um, I think they'd be surprised at how big the stadium actually is um, compared to the NPV stadiums. Uh, it's smaller. Um, and uh, I, think, I think the stadiums in the States fits more people. Um, 
I feel like there's more activities. I mean, it's completely different. We don't have beer girls at the stadiums. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, well, each stadium has a different atmosphere, but um, uh, gosh. So do you have to tell them, hey, just a warning, you're going to have to get up and get your own beer. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Um, but we don't have organized cheers like the pan. So yeah, it's, I, I mean, I think they have a, they have a great time at yeah. Angel Stadium. Yeah, I'm sure they do. I think Angel Stadium is one of the most underrated ballparks for sure. I love that. It's a, it's a nice spot and has aged well too. Yeah, I agree. How do you handle presenting information to traditionalists? Or those who are resistant to information from a female, and uh, and or are they hesitant to present? The, are you hesitant to present the information to them because you kind of know that this guy's a traditionalist? Jen, let's go to you on that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the Jen one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think um, I I think sometimes. I, you know, talking with like a baseball traditionalist, as you say, it is hard no matter who you are. And and I I think the best approach is to meet them where they're at and and try to find um you know the best way to communicate. Everyone learns differently, everyone absorbs information differently. So it might take a few tries to get something through to somebody. But um what what I think, and I'm I'm gonna preface this where I'm not a uh, super strong analytics person, but what I've noticed a lot about what we're tracking now is it, it's all things that that scouts used to see and and identify so you know they would say like i love how this guy like how the ball sounds coming off his bat and now you can be like well you know we have launch angle and exit velocity and we can measure that and so i think that's helped a lot um obviously there there are some um challenges of being a, a woman and trying to, to like explain it to somebody else. Um, but I think that um, it's really all about empathy and all about finding where that person is starting from, what understanding they have, and then building off of that. And I think that's true with like anything that you're, any topic you're talking about, right? If you're trying to convince somebody to like try a new food or, or whatever, you know, I, I think the, the key is just to figure out where they're at, figure out where they're coming from and start with that and build off of that instead of just trying to like shove new information down their throats and uh, and just hoping that they understand it. Yeah, good answer. Um, I right, we're right at the 90 minute mark and I promised I would keep it to that. So or if anyone wants to sneak in, let me know. But otherwise, um, I would like to thank our three panelists for joining. That was awesome. Tons of interesting conversation and, um, and insights. And uh, I know, you know, we had a good turnout here and I know a number of people who told me they're gonna watch afterwards. And so I appreciate you sharing your insights and, and, um, and being you know, candid and honest with them. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Okay, thanks for having yeah. us. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thanks for having us and thanks um, for all the wonderful questions. I'll be yeah. in touch when I get the million dollar, the, the hundred million dollar guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be um, a Indian. <laughs> yeah, there you go.